So, a very good afternoon, everyone, here in the room and um, viewers at home soon, because this talk will be uh, recorded. Um, I am very thrilled to see a full house for this. Um, this is uh, beautiful. I hope you all also get to see the exhibition, of course, which opens uh, subsequently to the talk. The doors will open at five o'clock. Um, and because we're very excited to share with you this exhibition that we have made over the last one and a half years called Seven Rooms and a Garden. Um, we're going to have a talk. Um, we're going to focus a lot on your works in the show, actually, just as sort of a possible way in. Um, we also did actually an interview um, for our website. This happened on Wednesday, which was a bit more focused on sort of, uh, sort of uh, other aspects of the show as well. So we're hoping that these two sort of uh, conversations kind of strengthen each other a little bit, rather than trying to talk about everything at the same time. Um, Rashid, welcome to Stockholm, first of all. I hope you've had a good time here so far. I have. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's good to see so many people here tonight, and, uh, or today. And uh, I hope that the snow on the screen isn't too troubling. Well, the intention is to hypnotize you, um, so you'll really love our show. So... Uh, <laughs> It's working. Um, so I want to um, start by talking about uh, God painting, a closed eyes, um, which you can see here uh, on the screen behind me. It is a painting that is made for this uh, exhibition. It is a new series that you have uh, sort of uh, started and you, yeah, you've been thinking about the series a long time but also thinking through the show about this work and vice versa. I'll talk about my experience with the work in a little bit but I would just want to start us off maybe in a very formal way because I, looking at this work, am so amazed um, that I can see almost how you've made it by sort of uh, applying multiple sort of uh, layers, of course, and then to sort of carve this symbol that we see, this sort of uh, almond-shaped symbol, which we will also talk about, of course. How Can you talk us through a bit about, yeah, how it's made? Like, because it's so visible and beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, thank you guys for, for coming to the talk. Uh, this is a really challenging work for me to discuss in that this is the first time I'm exhibiting these works and I'm really, you know, trying at this stage to kind of position myself um, around them and think about what brought me to making them, how they function, how they're going to be viewed. I feel incredibly sensitive about this body of work. There's a, a line I shared with, with Hendrik uh, earlier from an Erica Badu song where she says, um, before Tyrone, she says, keep in mind that I'm an artist and that I'm sensitive about my shit. <laughs> and I am. Um, this is not exclusively an intellectual or an academic pursuit. And for those of you who are practitioners, if that is the basis and, and the only purpose of your project, you're doing something incredibly wrong. Um, my level of sensitivity around kind of new forms or new themes or new concepts really uh, suggests what I hope to be at the center of my project, which is a, a sense of sincerity um, and an honest attempt to illustrate my concerns. So with that as the preface, this body of work uh, is, is, is made up of of oil paint, a pigment that I produce myself that is kind of a marriage of, uh, of, of, a, of a color that I, that I, I hesitate to say invented, um, but that I kind of uh, collaboratively came to with a company called RNF Paint. And that, this is a mix of that color and another color that, that's put together. And, and the entire surface of the linen is kind of coated in that red oil paint and, and uh, the resulting gestures are born of the removal of the paint from the surface. So in some ways it, it harkens back to earlier aspects of my project and an and, and interest that I had earlier in my practice in photography and this idea of removal or how gestures born on a surface, not exclusively through the act of addition, which is how we typically imagine paintings being born, is that the, the practitioner takes pigments and they add and they add and they add and images are born as a result. For me, I'm as interested in the idea of removal and, and, and the kind of process of 
adding something, removing something, and, and what kind of is born of, of the experience of this kind of um, contrast and opportunity. So uh, what you have here is this, this symbol that is uh, kind of carved out of the surface of the pain, and that is uh, something that they call a vesica pescus, or an almond shape. A vesica pescus is, is the space between two circles. So if we think about the circle as really one of the most kind of um, resolved of, of shapes, something that is you know cyclical, formal, understood. The space when they overlap and the thing that lives between them are what I like to think of as the liminal space is what is kind of conjured here. So it's almost an homage or a really kind of uh, graduated investigation of liminality or of spaces in the middle. And my project, when I think about it, oftentimes puts an enormous emphasis on liminal space or, or, or spaces in the middle. I had um, an opportunity recently to, to read a quote uh, of Willem de Kooning when he visited the exhibition of, of uh, Philip Guston when Guston was kind of more transitioning from abstraction to what we kind of know to be his, his uh, later representational work. And Guston said to, or, or, I'm sorry, de Kooning said to Guston, which I thought was just incredible, he said, uh, you know, your, your medium is, is freedom. And I thought to myself, well, what the hell is my work about? You know, um, if Guston gets freedom, you know, what do I get, right? Um, I, I was, I, my, my instinct was to say, me too. <laughs> you know, I second the, the opportunity for freedom to be the subject of my work, right? Um, but when I, when I do a, a deeper dive and in investigation and think about like really what have been the topics and the positions of concern that my work has attempted to navigate, I keep coming back to this idea of liminality, you know, of, of finding myself on the path to a conclusion, more so than being kind of located in that kind of final space. And so these works really are, you know, the beginning of an attempt to illustrate um, what is the subject of my project. Yeah. Thank you for that very rich uh, introduction to the work. Um, just maybe to dive a little bit more into the liminality and to situate you a bit within the exhibition. Um, this work is being shown in the first room. It is a room that uh, in a very expansive way deals with history of sort of a abstraction. Uh, we situate that in many ways in sort of the holdings that we have and that we show uh, as well. Um, so it's really a meeting place between sort of um, sort of the histories of, of sort of abstraction that we can show you uh, and this kind of new sort of a path in your take on sort of abstraction as well uh, through the symbol, through how you make and what it means within the larger scope of your work. Um, and it's become such a centerpiece of that show precisely because it embodies and wants to sort of uh, convey and hold that space of liminality that's sort of in between us so sort of uh, profoundly. And you've talked about, um, when we spoke on Wednesday actually, you said one of the reasons why this invitation to do the show intrigued you so much was because it invited you into a space of sort of uh, ambiguity, of sort of a project that never fully sort of uh, arrives and sort of uh, continues to manifest itself in the relationships that it makes between your work and many sort of uh, artists that we can show. Um, and I'm just sharing this to give you a bit of a sort of a framework, but can you just expand a little bit on sort of liminality within the scope of your sort of, uh, sort of, uh, sort of, uh, sort of a practice? Is that a word that has been with you for a long time, or is that more a thought that recently kind of came to you, actually? I think in some ways it's a word that's been with me for, for quite a while. Um, at different stages in my project, I was, there, there was the accusation that the work was um, opaque. And I was always incredibly frustrated by that because I had always felt that 
my intention was to be quite generous. And, and oftentimes I would leave all of the antecedent footnotes in my project literally almost in the work. So I would include the books that I was reading, the plants I was living with, the material I was applying to my body. So it was kind of like, it's all here. Like, what could you possibly expect more of me? And so I think liminality for me better represents what was more miscast in my project as opacity. That the work is really kind of part and parcel with the act of transition and growth and, and, and attempting to be really kind of present in whichever condition that I was in. I, I, uh, I've often said that my work evolves and changes in new bodies and new uh, modes and, and new signifiers and, and ways of representing are born, but that they're born from a, a, a genuinely kind of honest location, meaning that, you know, um, a, a week ago I turned um, 46. And so I'm not 40 anymore. I'm not 39. I'm not 37. And, and I'm living in a different body, like a, a, a literally different body. And, and I had a conversation earlier today with some friends about this concept of discorporation, right? The removal and the separation, which is really um, qu quite omnipresent in the Western condition, right? This idea that our minds and our thoughts are somehow removed from the kind of physical presence of our bodies, like the being. And if you really think about it, and, and you know, I'm, I'm attempting to project onto you guys, but do you see your brain and your thoughts encased in your body or kind of surrounding your body? Because, I mean, as I really unpack it, I see mine kind of surrounding my body like an aura <laughs> of some sort. But, but the reality is that it's, it's physically in my body, like my brain is in my body. Is this, is this weird? Does it sound like I'm tripping or something? <laughs> like I don't smoke weed, trust me. Like I'm nine years sober, this is a really conscious thought. But you know, this, this idea of like being present and kind of the, uh, the reality that I've kind of come to around aspects of my practice is that, you know, my body's engagement through gesture and through the kind of physical um, opportunity that you know me being an artist gives me to kind of output this kind of um, dichotomic position between my body and my mind feels like for me at this stage just unbelievably rewarding. I feel so in touch to, uh, with myself in ways that I that I hadn't previously, and that my work I think in some ways struggle to, to characterize. And so this work, and I'm glad we're getting to talk about it because you know I'm genuinely learning about this in real time and the stuff that I'm sharing, I did not practice in the shower earlier. Our, I haven't given this talk before. This is a, a kind of a moment of, of real kind of um, active uh, prescience. And so, you know, I guess we could get to almost what what I call them, right? Yeah. Which is, I call them God paintings, and, uh, which just feels like the most dangerous thing in the world. And, and the reason that it feels dangerous isn't because I imagine that the accusation is going to be that, um, that I imagine my perception of the concept of God is more valuable than your concept of God. It's that because I grew up an atheist and my father being evangelical in his atheism, that the idea of imagining that there is a way to discuss God inherently feels wrong. And it feels anti-intellectual in a way that I think most of my life wouldn't have allowed me to, to, um, to conjure. And so, and, and when I say God, I put this separation between God and, and, and religion and religiosity, just so that we all understand. Because we need like a semiotic framework here, right? And that semiotic framework is, I have decided that there's something that I don't know, right? It's like a Lawrence Wiener book. There's something on the table. Like, I don't know what it is. For the purpose of this conversation, I'm going to call that thing God. 
you can conjure whatever the hell it is you want. It can be the corner of the room. It could be a white guy in a beard. That's not mine. That's yours. That's fine for you to have. Um, it can be kind of whatever you imagine this kind of condition of not knowing is. And essentially, when I talk about God and the structure of such, I'm saying the space of, of, of not knowing. Mm -hmm. And the space of uh, closing your eyes and seeing a red, right? That is how the red came into this work as well as, and sort of, I sort of a point there because the work is also called sort of a closed sort of a eyes. And, and that moment that you sort of uh, have shared as well as that moment where you recenter yourself in a different way, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, the anecdote being that um, like I like I mentioned earlier, I I got sober nine years ago, and, and a friend told me I had to find a higher power. I didn't know what that meant. Uh, I didn't know how I was going to participate with that. It was again, kind of in some ways anti-intellectual in a way that was incredibly foreign for me. And uh, over the course of trying to understand what that was, I was I found myself on a beach, and I closed my eyes, and I and I. Uh, looked up at the sun and, and, and all of us can remember or even just look at the light and close our eyes now if you guys want to take this journey. And you see the red that lives behind your, your eyelids. And, and that was for me the moment when I said, well, I'm going to call that, I'm going to call that thing God. And it, it was really a, a moment of freedom for me in that it allowed me to kind of take in this idea of a kind of a spiritual self and marry it to all of the kind of conceptual and critical and philosophical concerns that have, have been housed in my work previously. And it kind of gave me this sense of agency that, um, that changed my perspective and, and, and gave me allowances that I had previously struggled to, to occupy. Thinking of another sort of Erica Baudu line, like most intellectuals do not uh, believe in God, but their fear is just the same. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> on that note, <laughs> gonna make a segue actually to uh, Bruce painting because uh, I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to talk about multiple works in the show, and this, like the first ones of the God painting truly being a piece that wrapped itself in and around the show in, in multiple ways because it's a live piece. As you said, this is a, a piece that you have made sort of uh, recently that was sent to us and sort of unpacked and anchored itself in unexpected ways. So I'm very excited to see it sort of continue to unfold, I guess, for both of us and for everyone who's in that room in, in many ways in the next year or so. Um, Bruce painting, Dexterity, it's um, in um, the fourth room of this exhibition in our seven rooms in the garden. Um, and it's uh, sort of adjoined there by many other works in the series. Um, Bruce Paintings uh, is a series of works that yeah, manifested itself fully in 2021. Uh, its motifs are sort of uh, older than that, actually. We see the motif of sort of the uh, anxious man, which is something that you first started to work with for the exhibition at the uh, Drawing Center in 2015, uh, which I give you an image of here. Um, and it's, it's evolved, it's matured, it has sort of uh, changed. I'm actually gonna bring us back to the first image because I want to talk about, um, of course, we could talk about sort of the uh, anxious man and we will, but first I wanna talk about the act of repetition. You're putting these anxious men or these manifestations in sort of a grid, which is, I mean, so the grid comes back in your work and so does the uh, exhibition in numerous ways and this is one of them and you're repeating a figure that is never the same. What sort of, uh, sort, of, sort of means that act of repetition for you? Yeah, I, I come by it honestly. It's, um, it's something that, that it feels quite, quite natural to me. And the grid, again, is this almost a space of, of that, feels, that feels democratic, almost like all of these shapes kind of carry almost the same amount of space. And then the way that they're activated in their interior kind of changes a little bit. But this work um, is for me, you know, very kind of meditative. 
And so when I've used and worked in, in, in grid and gesture in the past, sometimes it's been a real struggle. But these bruise paintings in particular, because of the way that the paint kind of flowed and the viscosity of this particular paint, they were um, just incredibly rewarding to make. And they felt like these meditations. And I was working on them in 2021, kind of coming out of what we had had to navigate in, in 2020, where I had made uh, paintings that were red that shared some of these same characteristics. But again, kind of back to this idea of, of, of liminal space and, and liminality, our spaces in between, 2021 felt very much like a liminal space. It felt very much like a space in between. Uh, I called these bruise paintings because I feel like it really kind of represented that in-between space. Uh, if you can imagine that a bruise is the position that exists between a blunt force trauma and the opportunity for healing. That the bruise is kind of, uh-oh. That is a cue for everyone <laughs> to silence their phone. It's okay. All right. No worries. Um, that a bruise is a uh, space between that kind of blunt force trauma and that opportunity for healing. And really, what you get in that in-between space feels almost quite melancholy. And I felt like this blue kind of lived in, in that melancholy space. Our, our, there's a great Portuguese word um, that I was introduced to just a few years ago called the sodad, or sodaje, which um, if, if somebody knows how to pronounce that better, I don't know. But um, not, not me. <laughs> But what it really kind of represents, and there isn't an English equivalent. There may be a Swedish equivalent, honestly. I think that there are equivalents in other languages. Uh, but that there's this kind of sense of longing, this sense of melancholy, a, a little bit of sadness, but not an overwhelming amount of sadness. It's almost like the sadness that you may experience if you dated somebody for three months and they broke up with you, <laughs> where you're kind of like, oh, what could have been, right? And so you're not overwhelmed by it, but I just love that space. And again, that kind of exists within that liminal space. But 2021 really kind of being that space to some degree, it was like we just were just so kind of brutally treated by um, the experience. And then it was uh, if this kind of question of, are we graduating? Is this changing? And, and I was really lucky to have a space where I could kind of work and to kind of work through my concerns during that period and, and illustrate those concerns and be kind of present for them and, and have this kind of active meditation. And, and in, the, in the course of this conversation, it's really interesting for me because the works that we're going to be talking about almost exclusively are works that share this almost spiritual condition. And not everything that I make is, you know, is vested in this kind of condition of, of um, you know, connectivity to the body, connectivity to the mind that's like kind of fully fleshed out in this way. But it's nice for me to be able to kind of have this moment to talk about these works in particular that don't necessarily find themselves rooted in kind of deeply critical concerns, but they find themselves very much um, beholden to um, very human concerns. And I'm rewarded by the opportunity to be able to kind of have a space in my work where I can have those conversations. Yeah. In the way that we talked about the works uh, being part of the show and how they were situated um, kind of as a room that you enter into and suddenly actually you find yourself in a way surrounded by these works. You're standing in the center of this space with kind of six of these very monumental works. Um, a word that came up and it's how we sort of uh, decided to name the room after even is a uh, witness. Um, that's these are witnesses to us walking into that room for sure, but vice versa as well, that we are sort of witnesses to them manifesting in that way. Um, could you expand a little bit on that word for me? Because it's a word that we've been sort of, sort of using a lot this week, the witness, and I feel it's a word that's also has been with you for a really long time. 
It is, and I think it's incredibly prescient to this exhibition and, and the way that we've been talking about it and the way that I've talked about it historically. And, and really, the, the reference point for me is, is the expectation that we have for, for viewers of an artwork. And when we uh, refer to ourselves in that viewership, how do we imagine our responsibility? And the word witness for me really kind of conjures an expectation. And that expectation is that when we say it, what we assume is that we can then visit that person and they can tell us about what, they, what, what it is that they saw, right? And we may not have the same expectation for someone who is a seer or a viewer, but if someone says, oh, I witnessed this, then the, the, the natural next question is, well, what did you witness? And tell us about it. And, and really what my expectation is for viewers, and, and I don't think it's um, too high-minded, is that you function as a witness when, when you look at an artwork. And it, it's something I remind myself consistently of when I go into museums and galleries. I say to myself, I, I really have this kind of process where I say, be a witness. Be a witness. You know, be someone who sees something and is capable of remembering what it is I saw and being capable of explaining that thing to someone else. And that explanation should be um, quite broad, meaning that I can have a dialogue and be in discourse with another artist uh, with high-minded ideas and kind of critical concerns being part, part of what it is I witness or that I can explain to, which has been incredibly challenging for me, as a father to my 12-year-old son what it is this work is about, both my work and the work of other artists that you know, I love that I realize maybe now is more difficult to explain. Like Talk to a 12-year-old about the work of Richard Tuttle and you'll find yourself in a situation where you're like, oh, well, you know, and I, I, as I joked with a friend earlier, my son was challenging the work of, of Robert Ryman, who, you know, makes white paintings. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's challenging. Many of us have accepted it. We've all kind of come to terms, you know. We all know why he did it, right? Do you? <laughs> you know? How well do you know it? Because when you're talking to a 12-year-old, you get quickly stumped as you're explaining these things. But really, that's all to say that if you function more as a witness or kind of prepare yourself with the expectation that you're going to have to kind of describe and be reliable in the way that you kind of diagnose or deconstruct the things that you see, then, then you uh, become, I think, better in your visual literacy. And it is a literacy to see. It is something that you have to train yourself to do. Just because you have eyes does not mean you are seeing anything. You have to develop a language. This is a skill. This is something we should be teaching more effectively in schools. Uh, we have uh, really created a process for cheating. And you see this when you talk to kids and other folks about art. Oftentimes, you'll show them a painting, and if they're you know, from an art background, they have one thought. If they're not from an art background, they'll often say, well, what does it mean? As if there's some sort of hidden kind of index of iconography and material and information that they don't have access to. And the fact that people feel that way is a huge disservice to not only what it is we do, but to how we archive and consider visual culture to be translatable and valuable and useful and employable and, and, and all around important. I mean, there's so much language in your response now that I want to take as a segue, actually, when you talk about visual sort of a, sort of a language, let's say iconography, sort of to be able to read an image. Um, which I very much associate very heavily with this work, actually, Antoine's uh, Organ, which is a work from 2016, the first manifestation, in a way, of um, a series of works, the latest of which features in this uh, exhibition as well. It is called Home. Uh, the room that is in, which is room number five, is named after it. Uh, there's not an image of it yet because all of these works are made new. 
Um, and so, yeah, we're also excited to share that kind of freshness with you, of course. I've taken this as a sort of an example, sort of uh, image. Um, but it gives us a good kind of uh, index here, I think. Yesterday evening, I mean, this is a live exhibition and we're coming to these thoughts often in a live way. Yesterday evening, I sort of, uh, sort of uh, clicked with the fact that this is an encyclopedia of sort of a practice. And it gives us a, a like, like uh, what's the word? Like a lexicon, like a lexicon of form somehow um, in relationship to your work. Uh, the actual work here sort of uh, comprises of m sort of numerous sort of uh, elements, of course, sort of the uh, plants, which are in these beautiful ceramics, actually. Each of one holds a form that I see resonant within your work, actually. There are books, there are sculptures, some made of like a she butter. There is uh, your film, The Hikers, on sort of um, small screens. There's, uh, there's countless things happening in this work that allow you to circle it time and time again and be a witness, but also to be invited into something, to become a part of something. It's, it's incredibly rich, but I think I want to start us off with talking about sort of a care and maintenance, which is often, you know, this, the starting point to think about this work. The maintenance of the work itself and the care that you imbue the host, the institutional host, with as well. Um, I've I never actually asked you this, and I don't know it. Um, in which way did you start thinking about this work? Yeah. It's, it's a really interesting question, and, and, and my answer is, is probably some, in some ways familiar, in other ways uh, quite complicated. When you look at the structure, of course, there is a, a, a natural reference point. And, and the natural reference point is, is an artist like Sal Lewitt, or artists that we think of as kind of housing this concept of, of minimal. I, I'm so hesitant to use the word because those artists don't describe themselves using it, and I'm trying to be a plumber's union artist meaning that I want to be present for what artists want for themselves. But for the purpose of this conversation, and probably for any conversation, I'm going to have to use um, you know, the projection of art historians onto artists' work to describe their work. So this is one of the burdens of semiotics, right? Um, are of certain kind of icon spaces. But uh, you know, these artists who, who made minimal works, or works that we consider to be minimal, had an enormous impact on my project throughout. Um, just thinking about structure, and then really starting to think about this idea of occupation. Like how we occupy something, why we would want to occupy something, what is our kind of physical relationship to it, an object, a concept, a theme. And so, you know, I would start with the anecdote of being 19 years old, a student uh, of art in, in, uh, in Chicago, and going to the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago and being exposed to the work of Carl Andre, who made these uh, uh, steel planks that would go on the floor, and, and, and there was an invitation, and we've, we've spoken quite a bit about the idea of invitation. There's this invitation to walk on the planks, and my friends and I um, decided that those planks, basically in their form, would make a fantastic breakdance mat. And so we decided from that point we were going to employ it as a breakdance mat. Like, you know, outside of any of his concerns, we had our concerns, and our concerns were about movement in the space, on the space, taking on the invitation, being present for the invitation. And I'm sure Carl Andre did not think to himself, this is what's going to happen. A bunch of young black kids are going to come into the museum and they're going to dance on this thing. And the guards, were really always taken aback. And oftentimes, you know, other patrons and folks who were in the room were like, what are these kids doing? And we were doing the exact right thing. We were taking advantage of the invitation. So really kind of starting there and thinking about, you know, how you occupy things that inherently have a kind of a space that give you agency for that occupation. The second example that I, I, I give, and it's important to it, is having visited um, the, the home and uh, kind of museal landscape that is Marfa, Texas, where Donald Judd housed so much of his work and 
how you were intended to function in those spaces. Now, Judd, of course, had passed by the time I had ever visited Marfa. And when I visited Marfa, Texas, you know, they give you this tour of the Donald Judd works, and they say during the course of the tour that you should not go in the Donald Judd works, and you should not stand on the Donald Judd works. The tour guide leaves, everybody <laughs> goes in the Donald Judd works and stands on the Donald Judd works. And so really what you're seeing in that is you're obviously being asked to do that if everyone is trying to do it, right? It's like you want to occupy it, you want to be inside it. And, and so what starts with these works for me is this idea of kind of taking the invitation, whether it was intentional or not, from something like Lewitt or something like Judd, et cetera, and saying, what would I put inside it? How do I kind of um, cast myself in this canonical history? How do I place my language, my concerns, the themes, the the things that I'm kind of considering. Um, again, um, you know, you suggested this idea of, you know, of the plants and maintenance and the expectation. I, I chose plants partially because I love the work of Hans Hacke, and I love the work of, 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 of there were several artists that I think I was, Marcel, Duch uh, Marcel Boutheres, of course, and that kind of the, the, the poetry in some of that work, and my mother with house plants. I'm not good with plants. I am not a botanist. I don't know more or less anything about plants. Um, I think a lot of times people think, oh, you must be very invested and involved with plants. I am not. You know, they're just alive. I know they're alive. And I'm interested in their liveness um, and the fact that they have to be maintained or not maintained that this work gives you an opportunity, or the institution an opportunity to fail, which is one of the things I'm most interested in. You know, I'm like, oh my God, are you guys gonna screw this up? I'm just like, I'm bated breath, you know? I'm clutching pearls, I'm, I'm ready. I wanna see what happens. And the thing that I learned in making these that was fascinating for me and far outside of my intention or expectation was that I was not the only one wondering, but I was more wondering from a curious position. You guys were really invested in the plants. And so people would come to the museum and they would be furious. And they would say, who's gonna take care of the plants? How are they going to take care of the plants? And I often joke, they would step over the body of a homeless man standing outside of the museum and walk in and scream at the people inside about who's gonna take care of these plants? It's like there's a man outside starving to death. But that's okay. What comes as a result is that empathy enters the space. And it's like I saw it in real time. I saw love enter the space. I saw care enter the space. I saw empathy enter the space. And then people would get the, the description of our intention, which was always wholesome by most institutions saying we have this plan, that plan. Actually, the best plan that we've had has happened here, so thank you for, for that, uh, the folks at Moderna. But when they got that explanation, there's this sense of relief and then this sense of looking that changes. You know, It's like they got satisfied that they had challenged the work, that they had challenged the condition. And now they were just kind of in this place where empathy was present. And I loved that it gave that opportunity. There was a different sense of, of what happened in the room after the fact. And that's something that I really kind of learned from these works. And I continue to learn from the things that I make. And even to go back to the God painting, mm -hmm. again, that titling is a challenge to you, right? You're like, oh my God, is this serious? Mm -hmm. You know? Is this a God painting? Like, what? is this, right? Like, how do I confront these kind of big human concerns? Because I think a lot of times we want more anecdote from an artist. We want to say, well, you know, is your work political, Rashid? Is it about Black Lives Matter? Is it about, like, where is the anecdote? Where's the simple solution that you are supposed to provide for me? Because I'm a person, I have discomforts, I need solutions. I need my queer artist to tell me what it's like to be gay. 
I need my women artists to tell me what and how they're troubled by being a woman. I need my black artists to tell me how racism affected them. And I don't want anything around the middle. I don't want any sort of relational critical concern here. I want you to tell me about something. I get to swallow that hole, and I get to go about my business. Well, guess what? That's not what Art's job is. Um, the filmmaker Kurosawa said something I thought was really quite brilliant. He said, the job of the artist, and this is the only job I also believe the artist has, is to not avert their eyes. That all you have to do is keep looking, right? That that's the only job that the artist has. So stop projecting all that crap onto me because it's not my job. <laughs> Word. Um, <laughs> I think, just to go back to what you were saying about sort of empathy, because I think if you get a viewer or a witness actually into that space of empathy, you're also making space for them. You're extending an invitation. And recently, kind of, you talked about this work that you're also showing this, and uh, I quote, I'm showing you this as a mark making sort of a tool as an opportunity to see my uh, sort of uh, commitment to it, my willingness to expose my thinking. Here's all the stuff I want to say. I am reaching out. And I think about this sort of a quote in relationship, in relationship to the books that you're putting into these works as well, which, which are really varied. And they're books that have been with you for a long time or for some time. Uh, some are new to it as well. It's, it's, I guess what I'm trying to get is how has, has that element of the book sort of shifted in the last seven years as you have been making this work? Well, you know, it's an archive and it continues to grow and, and new things come into it. I mean, I was lucky uh, to have Hendrik introduce me to a book that really informed what happens in this exhibition by an author named Kevin Kwashi, who then I was in conversation with, and we have a little booklet that uh, you guys can take when you see the exhibition. And that found itself, uh, this book, the, the, the book title is The Sovereignty of Quiet, and, and, and the, the challenge that he poses around the idea of black publicness and quiet and, and interiority all, were all these themes that I felt like my work had been illustrating. I was like, oh my God, this is, you know, this is home, I'm home here in, in this. Um, I come to books in, an, in a really honest way, in, in that my mother was an academic, and we had these, you know, these li this library when I was a kid. And it wasn't necessarily what was in the books initially that was my concern. It was that we had so many, you know, and that I would just kind of look at them, and they would create these lines throughout my house. and, and and you can imagine, you know, when, when you're six or, you know, five and six and seven, you're like, well, look at all of this stuff. Like, are these people hoarders? <laughs> like, what, are the, what do these people want with this material? And it's, so it's the, the kind of materiality of it that first kind of um, attacked me, right? And then, you know, you get to a stage where you start, like, slowly um, reading the, 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 the binder of the book, you know, you, you read the, what do they call the? The spine. You, you start to slowly read the spine, and I remember being about seven or eight years old and looking at the spine of a book, and it said, it was by Harold Cruz, and it said, The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. I remember thinking to myself, holy cow. Am I going to be expected to read this? And what is this crisis? You know? And then getting to another stage where you, then you slowly start to pick up the book. And you pick up, and it was Chinua Chebe, Things Fall Apart, right? And first you're, you're, you're intrigued by the titles. And it was um, Richard Wright, it was Native Son, and it was Black Boy, and it was, it was James Baldwin, Giovanni's Room. I thought it was just about some Italian guy. <laughs> you know? And so it's like you start, you have these, like, these relationships to them in different ways. It's not always just your final relationship to it, which as we all know, you get a book, you read a book, you put the book back, you then go tell everybody that you read a book, and you tell them how good it was or how much you disliked it. Um, but for me, it was really 
just the entire experience of it. And when I use books in the work, I'll often use them in multiplicity because I've always hated this idea of, of um, found object art. Not that I dislike other people's found object art. I dislike my work being considered found object art because I don't find anything, you know? I more or less search for everything. So I figure if I put in like seven copies of a book, you'll be like, oh no, he looked for that book. You know, he didn't find it. You know, this is not simple, not finding things. Uh, I'm looking for things. And I like that then it can become a, a mark making tool. Like it can kind of go back to that thing that I talked about when I was five and six and I was looking at the library, right? Not only and exclusively concerned with the content, but also interested in the objectness of it. And so I like the idea that there, in these works is a sense of the objectness as well as the content, and then there's the opportunity, right? And that opportunity is that potentially you can kind of walk away and say, well, maybe I'll go buy that book. Don't steal it from the installation because you, you might, I don't know what the system is here, if you go to jail or, you know. They will have to deal with me. Just don't do it because it's just, you know, just buy the book. There's also, you know, get a Kindle or whatever. But whether you decide to, to go that step further and start kind of investing yourself in the, in the kind of content or the opportunity for content. I think we see, um, I mean, one of the words that come up when I see this work is sort of, multi yeah, sort of multiplicity. And it's a word that also kind of sort of brings us to one of the last works in the show that we see of yours, which is the film uh, Black and Blue, which in so many ways was the work that we started off with as well, to talk about this show uh, to begin with. Um, because Seven Rooms, they sometimes, not in all, but um, sort of sort of a toy and they sort of a play with this notion of the home very strongly. And you'll see that in the exhibition. Um, and it's because we, I started to look at this film quite sort of intensively um, as a film where um, a main figure, sort of uh, played by you, um, situates himself in actually your own home. We see your family. We see you sometimes doing very sort of daily stuff, getting up, sort of, uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, brushing your teeth, sometimes unusual things as well. There's these sequences that feel like sort of reveries, you know, these sort of dreamlike sort of, sort of I, I was speaking with a friend this week and sort of daydreams almost, you know, that sort of uh, bring us into a multiplicity of like motifs of things that you have in your house or in your work as well. So it's that type of film where everything happens all at once. And, and the richness of that does not only sort of bring us into your work, it brings us into numerous modes of self-representation, which is this film as well, and it's definitely the room in the exhibition that's in sort of builds on that very strongly. Um, but it also really speaks how you've been thinking about sort of the domestic space. I was wondering if you could bring us into that space and why it's an interesting space for you. You know, this, this film was really challenging for me. And when I, when I came up with the, the concept, I felt kind of tickled by it. I thought, it, for me, it was funny because it was really this day in the life and making something that was incredibly mundane. You know, I wanted to make something that was very simple. Again, I make it around 2021, and I'd spent, you know, quite a bit of time with my family, as many of us had. And we, you know, we were pretty sick of each other. Um, but, you know, of course, there was still so much love. But, you know, it was really this opportunity to talk about something very, very simple in a way that, I, something that I thought of as, as being very simple. And as I started making the film and choosing the tableaus and the, the positions and the decisions and the concerns that I would kind of um, illustrate over the course of the film. And then we shot and edited the film. One of the great, great things, and this is kind of a consistent theme as I kind of learned from the, the, the work Antoine's Organ and, and the other works that use plants, et cetera, about how the audience kind of receives something. 
when we edited the film and I had this kind of first idea of, of what it was, this was about um, the black mundane, this kind of, this space of simplicity, this space of melancholy, this space of, uh, of, of just very little or almost nothingness. And I would often get responses from people who saw the film and they'd say, I was really expecting something bad to happen. And I remember thinking to myself, why, <laughs> you know? And what I realized is that, you know, since the protagonist was, was me, this kind of black protagonist that we are oftentimes accustomed to when we see kind of a black protagonist or, or this kind of black figure that is at the center of, uh, you know, film experience, that we can't help ourselves but prepare for the worst. And, and that preparation says more about us than it does about, about this film. Uh, I talk about, and this is one of the few times that I'll make an anecdotal reference specifically to how racism functions. And this is something I don't talk about a lot. And that my work isn't um, deeply focused on. But I was staying in a hotel once, a quite nice hotel in Los Angeles. And I went outside, I was still smoking back then. And I went out and I had a cigarette. And there was a, there was a doorman um, at the hotel door. And over the course of me having the cigarette, he got off work or whatever, and he was replaced by another guy. And so I sat there and I was finishing my cigarette and I thought, when I go back, I'm gonna have this confrontation, right? I'm gonna have this, this contentious confrontation where the expectation is not gonna be that I'm staying there and that I'm going to have to choose how I'm going to respond, right? Am I gonna go, am I gonna ask to see his manager? Am I gonna tell him to go fuck himself? And like, which way am I going to respond to this inevitable exchange? And so I prepared myself um, in a significant way to deal with it. And I walked back to the desk, or to the, to the hotel door, and the guy, as you could expect, says to me, welcome. <laughs> this isn't to in any way suggest that racism doesn't exist. But I had done the work already. It didn't matter what he did. I had done the work myself. It lived inside me. It didn't take on our need to be presented to me. I owned it. And so it's amazing how often you find yourself owning conditions rather than having them kind of vested are presented to you. And so with a film like this, when you do find yourself wondering or expecting something of it that maybe doesn't exist in it, you have to ask yourself, what inside me has presented me with these sets of concerns? Now, some of you may not have this, and now that I've spoiled it for you, you will not have this opportunity. You can all be very kind of conscious of the mundanity and the simplicity and the, the belief structure that is present in it. But it's, it's something that I, you know, I, I felt like since I'm here, I may as well sh share with you what I've learned yeah. from the work as, uh, uh, in relation to what its intentions were. I'm also, um, maybe as a last sort of a question or making my way towards the end, because I also want to um, give you an opportunity actually to ask some uh, questions, of course, if you have any, uh, and of course, to see the show. Um, I was very struck by also some stylistic sort of uh, choices that, that you had made, especially in these daydream type of featurettes that are sort of sprinkled throughout the film. There's a sort of Dogma 95 link there that I think is quite interesting since we are in the North uh, to kind of highlight a little bit. Stylistically, like um, who did you build on a little bit there? And, and am I reading into this or is this an actuality in the, is what I'm thinking? No, there's definitely, so I, my, my filmmaking history includes really a lot of kind of 
dogma concerns. This film is a real graduation from other films that I think were better representations of those concerns. Like a, earlier films, um, like a film I made called Me, Tavis, Smiley, and Shea Butter, which I think is really kind of invested in kind of dogma strategies. Um, this film, interestingly enough, is shot with a 35 millimeter camera. So this is like, I'm, uh, this is a small kind of crew. This is a real kind of picture. This is um, more broad for me than um, video art typically kind of uh, presents itself as, as being. And so it's, um, you know, it's, it probably owns, owes more to M Melvin Van Peoples than anything else, even though you don't see it as much, but with some of the cuts. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, I'm into French New Wave cinema as well, so it owes some to Godard. But it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's its own vehicle as well. Um, Melvin from Peebles, that's, uh, of course, I'm very thankful that you th throw out that name. Um, an amazing filmmaker, actually. Uh, musician as well. Um, you knew him at the end of his life. Um, he plays a role in this exhibition as well because we've made a, a song list for the exhibition. Um, I think that's, I'm just saying that for you to not miss it as well because it's a really beautiful layer in the show that I think it can, can, can be accessed uh, in that way from like Frank Zappa to Melvin from sort of upheavals to De La Soul to many other features. Um, and I think one of the exhibition, what's one of the things that the exhibition does, and, and it's maybe what I want to end with, is it there's a lot of forms of art that meet in this show, whether it's sort of uh, music and visual art and film. And I feel that that has also been, you know, one of sort of the defining features of your work. Like it is like sincerely multimedia. And uh, we also talked about you, know, you coming into a time where sort of medium specificity was uh, really out of fashion. You had to do a lot, right, a as an artist. How do you relate to that now, that you're more in a sort of a mature moment in your work, of course? I mean, you've been making art for a real long time now. What is your relationship to media as such, and perhaps within this uh, sort of a exhibition as well? I, I feel like I'm, as an artist, I'm born into what Rosalind Krauss called the post-medium condition. I, I think of that condition almost as a disease, but one to which I have a, a very natural inclination towards. I did not know at an earlier stage in my, in my kind of art practice what it was I was. I, I, I say that in a sincere way. I didn't make um, paintings in a traditional way. I wasn't a filmmaker exactly. I wasn't a sculptor exactly. I didn't. I had no idea what it was. It wasn't really until I saw the work of David Hammonds, and then I just asked somebody, "What is that guy?" And they said, "He's an artist." And I was like, "Oh shit, that's what I am." I guess, you know, because previous to that, I just didn't even know. I was like, "I'm a guy who wants to do all these different things." And of course, as you mentioned, I came up in a time when, you know, there was a real kind of um, investment in, in post-medium space. And, and what, where I studied early, they called 4D, which was like, you know, they were like, take away, they would almost like take away your paintbrush and like give you a video camera. And everybody made these horrible videos. But it was this, this kind of moment that I think was really, really important in pushing and making space for, for different mediums. I mean, even at that time, I mean, honestly, painters were seen as you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, it was kind of like, well, mid 90s, late 90s. Um, it was like painters and, and medium specific people were, I, I don't want to say it, but we thought that they were dumb. <laughs> you know, we were like, oh, look at this idiot with his paintbrush. It's like, what do you want, a, a schmock <laughs> and an easel? Like, look at this guy, what are you, Ben Go? Um, that's, that's changed. The painters have stormed back. Um, they're amazing. And, and I count myself amongst them. But from where I was born as an artist, it was really um, kaleidoscopic what and how you could use mediums and materials and to push yourself. And I got stuck there, and I, and I still live there. I feel like um, 
I'm one of the last ones who's living there. But I, uh, I, I appreciate the space that, that I've been able to make there, and, and uh, I value every approach. Thank you. I think um, I also want to extend an invitation to dive as deep as you would like, of course, in seeing the show in the last room. This book will be made sort of uh, available uh, for free. Uh, so sort of uh, grab it. There's many sort of uh, motifs that we have spoken about that you mention in, in that book as well. And it's a wonderful read after having uh, listened to us on, on stage. Um, I could go on for a real long time, but um, please do raise your hand if you want to ask something as well. We have a bit of time for that before we sort of uh, close off. Um, and if there's not, then of course that's also completely okay. Yes, hi. I'm going to walk towards you if that's okay. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, Rashid, thank you so much for such a fascinating discussion. And um, I really was intrigued by what you said in terms of how certain viewers or witnesses try to project certain things um, onto your work, um, race specific things onto your work. And I was just wondering if you thought that by the fact that you, it seems to me, intentionally try to um, present the mundane or the simplicity, that that is some form of resistance or statement on your part, is that also intentional? Sort of just putting it out there and maybe it not being so dramatic in, in the form of the, the video, for example. I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. No, it's, it's a good question. I do often, and I've, I've spoken about this around the work of other artists who I admire, like the painter Sam Gilliam, who really used color as a vehicle that not discussing certain topics to which you're expected to discuss specifically can be a quite radical gesture. Um, but avoidance of topics uh, can oftentimes be a reflection of, of, of responding to something. So I really like to vacillate in my project around things that, that matter to me when they matter to me. I'm trying my best to be really, really honest. I mean, my mother's an African history professor. When I talk about, and, and, and African American studies as well, so when I'm talking about those things, I want to talk about them when I want to talk about them. Like, I want, I'm looking for agency here, meaning that I want to discuss race when I want to discuss race. And then I want to talk about formal things when I want to discuss formal things. And then I want to talk about Deleuze and Gattare when I want to talk about Deleuze and Gattare. And I want to talk about a thousand plateaus. And I want to talk about philosophy. And I want to talk about love. I want the opportunity to do really more or less anything in my project. And so that's where I have to become conscious of not avoiding certain subjects uh, because I think it's going to satisfy an expectation. So I, I can't remove things, um, and I'm not going to add things specifically to satisfy an audience. So really, in the end, it's this, um, this process of trying to learn how to center my own concerns, right? And say, what are my concerns, you know, outside of the audience, outside of the expectations? And then, um, and then, and, and, and do those things. There's, there's a great documentary about the filmmaker Melvin Van Peoples, and the title, I think, really describes how I would like to live my life. And the title is, How to Eat Watermelon in Front of White People and Enjoy It. <laughs> yes, Salad, I'm coming to you. Hold on. To come to the side a little bit for me, perhaps. Thank you. Um, thank you for this lovely talk. I want to ask you about the film that you did, Native Son. I really liked it, and uh, how was it for you to be in the art world and then do that film, and will we ever see more films from Rashid Johnson? Thank you. Oh, thanks for asking that. That was the hardest thing I've ever done, is make a feature film. It, it, it challenges things about an artist that I didn't expect to be challenged. What it really comes down to is when you're making art and you're responsible for everything that it is you output, everything is about your ego, right, more or less, right? What you want, what your goals are, et cetera. 
when you're making a film, everyone has an ego. You know, the actors have an ego. The 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 art department has an ego. Uh, the producers have egos. The 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 DP has an ego. I I think that the best filmmakers would probably be curators, to be honest, because they're used to dealing with other people's egos constantly. And so that was a real learning experience for me, one that was incredibly rewarding, very challenging material. I'm working on a, a script now, and I'm taking my time. I will definitely make another film, and I'll definitely approach it with a different level of consciousness than I had in the first go. One more. Um, One more script. Please. I'm not going to be able to reach you. <laughs> You're going to have to come to the side in some way if that's okay. You could just yell it. Well, it's um, uh, recorded. I want to make sure people catch the questions, but let's pass it. Thank you. That's a good idea. Thanks. First of all, sorry for my English, but uh, congratulations on your work, and uh, it was an honor to hear this amazing conversation. You said that earlier something like everybody has eyes but not everybody can see and then refer to like your son who always who like uh, like young people always need like a specific answer to understand these kind of things how would you like teach young people to see and how would you like implement it in the school system system if, if it was up to you that's great i wish i had a really good answer for that <laughs> i really do it's it's such an important question because I pose the kind of confrontational position and then I'm like, and I have no answer for that. <laughs> but I, I think in a simple way, I think we really have to um, find a way to stay away from anecdote and to lean into poetry. I think we need to be teaching, teaching poetry. We need to like make space for this idea that you can't get all of the answers and it's okay you know that it's okay not to know that it's okay to interpret things for yourself that there aren't solutions to every problem as we can see this is a complicated world and we have to start to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable and I think that's kind of a wholesale change um, in in the West uh, in the way that I was educated because the expectation was that we had answers and that we were going to find them and that that was the goal. And it's hard to re-educate oneself to realize that it is perfectly fine to not know. So to your point, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Rashid Johnson.